Thank you, Angry. And thank you to all of you, especially, for coming out tonight and showing your support on, and your interest in Australian Liberty Alliance. I believe that the greatest enemy that everyday Australians are facing right now is the unbelievable beast called political correctness. This is a damaging, insidious, appalling disease that is infecting every single areas of our lives. It's infecting our common sense and our Australian values of decency, democracy, equality and freedom. The number one policy in our manifesto for the Australian Liberty Alliance is for smaller, smarter government. Traditionally, that was a conservative position held by the Liberal National Party. But they have failed, big time. And they are being seduced more and more every day to spend our money, the money that you and I earn every day, on ridiculous and even harmful government programs that are a threat to the security of our nation and to the safety of our children. If you thought, uh, I know no one here is part of the Malcolm Turnbull fan club, <coughs> but Malcolm Turnbull and his co are left-leaning populists who spend more time appeasing minority groups than they do governing this country. No better example of that has been this week and this weekend when he was at the Mardi Gras smoozing a minority group and then visits the Islamic Council in Victoria and lectures us on how wonderful Islam is. The Labor Party and the Greens are pridefully boasting about their socialist agendas for our country that will expose us to even greater threats, that will continue to diminish our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, equality and our democracy itself. The Australian Liberty Alliance stands for the common sense values that have made Australia the great nation that it is. And it is one of the most desirable nations for anyone in the world to want to live in because of those conservative values that our forefathers fought, bled and died for. Bernie mentioned them and I want to reinforce that, that we owe it to those generations and to future generations to stand up for these values. The current government is full of career politicians who are seriously out of touch with everyday Australians. They spend more time passing legislation that will feather their own nests and protect their own careers than they do about debating the real and present danger of Islam and the out of control national debt that we currently have. Our national debt is exceeding $400 billion and the way Ron broke it down tonight was just staggering. And we have to get serious about cutting spending. Increasing taxes and penalising you and I, the ones who have worked hard, the ones who are contributing and responsible in this society, is not the solution. As the number of responsible, financially com contributing members of our society is decreasing, and yet, as has already been said, we're bringing more welfare dependent people into this country, and government spending is ever increasing. That leaves a huge burden for you and for me and for our children and for our grandchildren that I find unacceptable. Pick any portfolio and you are sure to see evidence of wasteful government programs. There is excessive bureaucracy in health and education, in fact all areas of public service. More taxpayer, ta sorry, taxpayer funded programs exist today than ever before with less outcomes for our students and our, our patients and everybody else. Politicians are paid over and above their salaries in ways that are completely disproportionate to what they actually do. They are entitled to pensions and superannuation after they cease serving their constituents in a way that's not consistent with any other industry in Australia. We need one law for all. Yes. As has been mentioned, Islamic schools are receiving millions, millions and millions of dollars of our money in government funding and they are shown to be corrupt 
and they are still operating. It is mind boggling. We're throwing almost a billion dollars at climate change and not one cent is gonna make any iota of difference to the actual climate. <laughs> Last year, the government allocated 13.4 million to fund some de-radicalization programs. As Bernie said, this included Muslim-only football games and other feel-good activities, but not one dollar that I'm aware of was spent on educating Muslim youth that they are not to take the Quran literally. <laughs> Bernard exposed last week that thousands of dollars are, giving to, are given to is, um, Islamic organisations for mosque, mosque open days when there isn't even a mosque to open. It is insane. We've recently been confronted by the Safe Schools Program. Some government department somewhere approved that content and approved millions of dollars of our money to go into this program that is far more about activism than it is about education. And this so-called anti-bullying program is, um, is run by first-class bullies who are bullying, bullying you and I in every word that they say. <laughs> desperately trying to promote, protect their own interests and to promote their interests. Meanwhile, our educational outcomes are falling every year. Our students are going down in um, international rankings and we have to do something about this. Our Defence Force has featured in the media during the past few months, but not because of their acts of valour that they should be known for, not because of outstanding achievements, which they are doing, but because the top brass are obsessed with a minority religious group, making sure they've all got halal food, as well as pay paying for gender reassignment and shoving political correctness down our throats. Doesn't matter which way you turn, there is wasteful government programs, that are more about special interests, appeasing people and political correctness. And nowhere is political correctness more toxic than when it comes to the issue of Islam. As you know, the discussion about Islam in this country is very rarely about Islam. <laughs> Commentators and politicians just get bogged down in name calling and along with tangents such as who is a good Muslim or a bad Muslim. And that is not what this conversation should be about. It is time to cut through this rhetoric and actually have a dis debate and a discussion about the true nature of Islam. Many of you are probably aware uh, of an article and a challenge that I put out to Craig Laundie, the MP, who's been promoted to the Assistant Minister of Multiculturalism. <laughs> Big eye roll there. Um, he made some very public and questionable statements, the most uh, well known were that anyone who speaks or criticises Islam is not well informed or wrong. He was criticised by some in the media. I did challenge him publicly to a debate. Chris Kenny from Sky uh, invited us both onto his program to debate it. Of course Craig did not turn up and was not available for any comment. I turned up, that's another story. But social media went into overdrive and it was something that Sky, Chris Kenny and many others had to take notice of. People want this debate. Hundreds of people left comments on Craig Laundie's Facebook page and he said nothing. And then last week when given an opportunity by the Australian newspaper to write an article, he lectures us on the value of cultural diversity and not once does he mention the word Islam. This newly promoted assistant to, uh, to multi, for multiculturalism does nothing but take a condescending tone towards voters, the people in his electorate and you and I, and all he does is make divisive statements that are not contributing to a healthy discussion in this country whatsoever. Last year, Waleed Ali, oh, I was going to say last year, Waleed Ali criticised Tony Abbott in, in an article. In fact, he did it in at least 17 articles and I suffered through reading 21 of them to find that 17 were about his obsession with Tony Abbott. But again, I, pub I publicly challenged him to a debate. It went berserk in social media. Nothing. He will not defend it and he will not discuss Islam. 
Anne Arley, the West Australian candidate for Cowan, the so-called counter-terrorism expert, again, makes makes outrageous statements in the media, but when she's challenged, she goes back into a hole and won't say a word. Well, I'm standing here before you and I will say, I will not give up. I will persist. And I'll talk to myself if I have to, but I'm gonna keep talking about it. <laughs> Thank you. Most Australians agree, and I can even look around the room and see that we are a multi-ethnic integrated society. And we've done it probably more successfully than just about any other country in the entire world. Possibly besides Israel. They've probably done it even a little bit better, but we're way, way, way up there. But the problem has arisen with multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is divisive and it encourages separation. It results in censorship, where we're not allowed to criticise any value or any practice that is in opposition to our Australian norms. We have a rich and wonderful tradition, and I've said this over and over, that we can criticise, satirise, um, have a go at just about anything, any ism that you want to find in this country. We've, we've done it with Catholicism, Christianity, we've done it with Nazism, Communism, Socialism, Marxism, you know, every ism you can imagine. But now, in our own country, we're being censored about discussing Islam. It is time to ask some serious and sincere and obvious questions. The Quran, we are told by Muslim, is the inspired word of Allah given to the Prophet Muhammad. The hadiths are the circumstances, stories and accounts explaining those verses in the Quran. And it is the Quran, the hadiths and the example of, the, of Muhammad that define Islam, not all the interpretations that we get from the clean shaven, the hairy faced, whoever it is that gets up in our media and tells us this is who, what Islam is really about. No, it's defined by these texts. Now thankfully, and I do say thankfully, the majority of Muslims in Australia, well they may even be considered apostates by some, of, some people who are Muslims, but they don't take the Quran literally. They're not running around raping slavery, um, in being involved in terrorism or underage child marriages. But unfortunately there is an increasing number of Muslims, both here and around the world, who do take those commands literally. And the very real and present danger for us is we don't know who is going to be the next Muslim to take those verses literally. But what is, even all that aside, let's take all the alarmist, or we're called alarmist things out of it. But let's look at what is happening right now in this country by the followers of Muhammad. They endorse and they subscribe to incredibly misogynistic behaviours and attitudes that result in women being oppressed in our country here and now. There are women who are forced to wear oppressive clothing against their will. They must be chaperoned by a male relative when they go out in the streets, here in Sydney, in Melbourne, in Perth, in Brisbane, wherever it is. There are girls being subject to FGM and people are getting away with it and they're not being prosecuted. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of young Aussie girls in this country right now who fear being married off with an arranged marriage either here or overseas. The Pakistani government recently refused to ban underage marriages as it would be blasphemous and go against Islamic teaching. We have Pakistani immigrants here in this country and we have plenty of girls who get taken to Pakistan in their summer holidays and never come home. We can be utterly relieved that the majority of Muslims disobey the direct commands of the Quran, such as Surah 812, where it says, I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. But, as I said, how do we know who will be the next Muslim to take these verses literally? It seems that the Islamic community, the media, and particularly the political class, are always so shocked whenever an Islamic youth attends the mosques more, prays more, becomes more devout, and then either plans or carries out a terrorist attack on our soil. It is time to join the dots and it is time to call that spade a spade. <laughs> I 
I've asked the question and I'm going to ask it in every public forum I can until I get an answer. We will have an answer, but I want to keep putting it forward, and that is, who is the true Muslim? The one who modernises, westernises and reinterprets the passages of the Quran, or the one who takes it literally? <laughs> the Australian Liberty Alliance proposes a 10-year moratorium on permanent resident visa applications from OIC countries. <laughs> it is essential that our country is able to determine its own measures and its own borders for security and it is essential that we ensure our citizens accept one law for all and utterly condemn every part of Sharia law that is in direct opposition to equality, freedom and democracy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the reality is many aspects of Sharia law have already crept into our society. Craig Laundy, the Associate Minister for Multiculturalism, needs to give an account for some appalling practices that are going on not just in this country but in his very own electorate which is just down the road from here. I want to know what is he doing to protect the women and the vulnerable girls in his electorate who are forced to wear that divisive religious garb against their free will. What is he doing to protect the women in his electorate who aren't allowed to go out unless they're chaperoned? What is he doing? What is Laundy doing? What is the LNP government doing? What is Turnbull doing? to stop the illegal Sharia practices that are already going on in this country when it comes to settling things like divorce, uh, mediation, custody, custody sorry, and inheritance matters. We have a plural legal system that's going on already and it must be stopped. And you know what? It's the immigrants who represent the persecuted minorities that get very little media or political attention. Well, I'm going to shine the spotlight on them and I am going to be their voice, unashamedly. They have suffered greatly as victims of jihadis who have butchered their family members while shouting Allah Akbar and quoting passages of the Quran. We owe it to those people to have a reasonable and rational debate about the ideology of Islam that has driven that has driven these Muslims in other countries to do this to these people and they have fled here to Australia where now they're finding that they are being censored and discouraged from talking about their real experiences. Many are at, are at their wits end and they are asking where else can we go and our PM adds insult to injury by, sorry, injury to insult by lecturing them about the merits of Islam and how much it's contributed. Will we be a society that encourages honest debate or will we self-censor and adhere to Islamic blasphemy laws that demand we do not criticise Islam and the Prophet Muhammad? I've, I've taken my stand. Debbie and Bernie and John and others have also made their stand and I challenge you tonight to make your stand, to make a decision, if you haven't already done so, to stand for the truth, to stand for what's right and to stand for the future of this country. I do want to share, again, some of you may have read this on social media this week, but please bear with me because I think it's an important story that demonstrates how infuriating the disconnect is between the media and some sections uh, of mainstream Australia at the moment. David O'Shea, who's formerly an SBS, uh, who was formerly a producer and reporter with SBS Dateline and ABC Late Line, called me regarding a documentary series. Of course, he was very nice and courteous over the phone. But the moment he said to me this documentary series would be called Extreme Australia, a little red flag went off for me and I had a laugh out loud and said to him, why on earth are you talking to me? Because I don't think you're referring to jumping out of planes, big deadly spiders, scary snakes or any of the, of the sort. His response that was one of the uh, episodes would be about immigration and of course my views are very extreme when it comes to immigration according to him and they wanted to follow me around with a camera and some person named Reggie Yates and get the real story. Well I've never heard of him and I don't even watch TV. 
Um, but they have made these other extreme Russia, extreme South Africa. He sent me the links so that I could watch it online. So my hubby, Greg, the gorgeous guy down the back, and I <laughs> decided that we would uh, have a look at one of these episodes. It might be a great way to promote Australian Liberty Alliance. Who knows? But you know what? I think we actually deserve a really great big fat medal for sitting through the most appalling hour of television I've ever watched in my life. It was a perfect example of why we don't watch TV and when we do, we never watch BBC documentaries. <laughs> this publicly funded documentary simply reinforced to me how shallow uh, left-wing socialist propaganda uh, the BBC and even their ABC has become. It's all about creating perceptions for a dull and completely stupid audience that wants to be spoon-fed misinformation. Our public broadcaster is full of bias, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I've experienced it firsthand on a number of occasions now. So I'm not speaking from theory, I'm speaking from practice. And the Australian Liberty Alliance is committed to privatising SBS and as, as our secretary says, putting ABC on a very strict diet. Balanced diet. Balanced diet. <laughs> Our, public, uh, our publicly funded broadcaster must represent a greater spectrum of views and go back to the charter it was given in the first place. But the most astounding thing out of all of this is that normal, everyday, mainstream Australians are now called extremists. And as Angry said, you know, that's a badge that, that he and us can wear with pride, but it is absolutely astounding that that is the position we now find ourselves in. By inviting me to appear in this program, it appears that if you want to protect the good old fashioned values of freedom, equality, a democracy, you are now called an extremist. But if you want to be a pious, devout, Quran-following Muslim, you're just a lone wolf and deserve tolerance and a heap of money for de-radicalisation <laughs> programs. If you've been a part of this amazing Australian culture that's integrated well with all ethnicities and belief systems, you're also an extremist. But if you want to form enclaves and cause divisiveness, with your halal and haram food, your offensive clothing, your gender apartheid and religious beliefs, that's got to be protected and tolerated. We need more tolerance for these things. You see, the implication is that extreme Australia is demonstrated by people who oppose halal certification and want a 10-year moratorium on immigration from OIC countries. It is utterly absurd and completely offensive. And I did point this out to David O'Shea and I did say to him as well, if you want Extreme Australia, just watch Q&A. <laughs> I, I haven't, I've never been able to watch a whole episode. I can only watch the bit of the clips that somebody sends me. I can't stomach it. I also said to him, and some of you would have heard, that I think the real documentaries that need to be made are Extreme Pakistan, Extreme Saudi Arabia, extreme, you fill in the, the gaps. Now that, that would be good viewing. How about you take a film crew to Saudi Arabia and record the sermons and the attitudes, well, pretty much of just anyone walking down the street, really, or going to any mosque there. I said, why not take a film crew to Mecca or Medina? Oh, that's right, you can't, because you're not Muslim. How about you film one of the 157 beheadings that are likely to be carried out this year that will be government sanctioned and religiously endorsed? Happens in the public square, so I don't think you'll have any problems getting footage of those. What if the BBC took a female interviewer into Saudi Arabia without a burqa and started investigating that government sanctioned violence that's carried out about, against women and minority groups and gays every day of the week there? What about extreme Egypt? What about a report on Taharush? I mean, can you seriously believe there is an Arabic word that describes the game of many Muslim men surrounding a female victim and sexually assaulting her in public? There is a word for that. That makes me sick. But we know Lara Logan, I think CNN or CBS, She'd be there, she'd be interviewed, and then you'd have a thousand other girls from Cologne willing to line up and be interviewed about that one. 
All the while, and while they're there, I suggested that the BBC could also check on the welfare of a four-year-old boy who was just recently committed to life in prison for committing murders when he was one. Now, of course that didn't happen, but the judges were operating under Sharia law, and the law is the law is the law, and it cannot be changed. I would like to see the talking heads and the Reggie Yates and the Tony Joneses and whoever else it is actually outraged at the misogyny, ignorance and stupidity displayed by these kinds of extremists. I could go on and on and on and on, but I won't tonight. But what I am going to do is focus on representing you, mainstream Australians everyday Australians, responsible Australians who have contributed to this nation, Australians of every nationality and all kinds of belief systems who are fed up with this kind of political correct nonsense. And yesterday, as I've already mentioned, the PM visited the Islamic Council of Victoria, something that no Prime Minister has done since the 1980s. And this is what he is quoted as being said. He says to the Islamic community, you are an integral part of an Australian family that's bound together by shared values of freedom, <laughs> democracy, <laughs> and the rule of law. <laughs> Seriously, that's what he said. <laughs> the freedom and the rule of law that Muslim girls experience in Australia is not equal with the freedom and the rule of law that my daughters experience in this country. His condescending tone and his inability to have a mature, vigorous and honest conversation about Islam is as pathetic as his inability to make decisions and to govern this country. We still have no policy for economic recovery, but we're all lectured about the benefits of special interest groups and minority groups that are divisive and are a real threat to social cohesiveness in this country. So if you've had enough of political correctness, of wasteful government spending, the endless promotion of special interest groups who are detrimental to our society, if you've had enough of the encroachment of Sharia law and you want representation in government by plain speaking citizens who are not afraid to call a spade a spade, if you want senators and MPs who will stand up for individual liberty, equality and democracy, you have no other choice but to vote one ALA.